Smoking gave me COPD, which makes it harder and harder for me to breathe. I have a tip for you. If your doctor gives you five years to live, spend it talking with your grandchildren. Explain to them that your grandpa's not going to be around anymore to share his wisdom and his love. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. And I'm running out of time. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. I'm William Shatner. America's vet dogs are assistance dogs with a special mission, helping disabled veterans of all eras regain their dignity and independence. They are guide dogs for the blind or service dogs for those with amputations, traumatic brain injuries, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Some are even deployed overseas to comfort soldiers far from home. A vet dog can help with daily activities and takes the focus off a veteran's disability, giving them the motivation to conquer new challenges and return to the lives they once led. That's why the law allows service dogs any place that's open to the public. America's heroes deserve our gratitude and support for the sacrifices they have made for our country. Please join America's Vet Dogs in their mission to serve disabled veterans and active duty personnel. To learn more, call 866-838-3647 or visit VetDogs.org. Hello, my name is Olivia Hines and I am part of the Occupy Northwest Arkansas movement. And you are watching Fayetteville Public Access Television. Hi, I'm with Aubrey Shepard. We're going to discuss a book called Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. Okay, Aubrey, um, what's a native plant? What's a native plant? What's a native plant as opposed to like a triffid? Well, it's, it's I, did, I got a triffid joke in there. <laughs> what's, a, what's, a, what's a native plant? It's, it's a plant that's been growing where it's growing for so long that uh, uh, nobody remembers, nobody's around who remembers, and there's no history uh, that it was from any place else. Yeah. The things that we worry about as native plants in the United States are things that we know were brought over from other countries, and they become a problem when they, you know, override the native plants. They become more successful. Right. And some of the reasons are that the uh, native plants do well in certain soil, certain light conditions, and they have uh, places they can grow despite those bad things. Okay. Sometimes you find native plants coming out of pavement between the cracks in a road or sidewalk. Okay, yeah. And they they struggle. So many of them are perennial plants. What, what, don't, don't people usually just refer to those as weeds? A lot of them are weeds, and weed's a good name. Milkweed, ironweed, the list of things with word na uh, yeah. weed in its, in its name, the list of those plants yeah. is endless, and so many of them are natives, and they're good. But weeds are mostly thought of as the things you don't want in your yard, things right. you don't want in your garden. So people routinely pull out whatever it is, try to poison it, try to do anything they can to get rid of things. And sadly, it's the native plants, the true native plants, that uh, Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, lists in, in some detail uh, with things they harbor, and by that I don't mean just getting nectar, butterflies taking nectar, but that the um, creatures lay their eggs yeah. on these plants, and the eggs turn into caterpillars or whatever category, and as they develop and they eat the foliage, right. in the case of milkweed is the big uh, show plant for monarch butterflies. Right. They're highly uh, 
they're desperately in need of help on, okay. on, in the whole, this whole continent. Uh, the ones that you see here in the summer and right now in late fall, they're migrating. Okay. And those monarchs are going deep into Mexico to spend the winter and they have to have certain habitat down there. I don't know whether there's any milkweed right where they're, they spend the winter or not because right. they're not producing young down there. They have to live eight months. Think how delicate a butterfly is. Yeah. Fly to cross parts of the, the Gulf of Mexico to get there. Okay. And then, then fly back eight months later. They have to remain right. sheltered in a certain species of tree and I'm not good at my age at recalling all the names. Yeah. The, the uh, downs go away. So um, the, if, if they can survive down there, if the trees they've been going to in the past, their ancestors, yeah. are still there, then they're sheltered from the worst of the winter down there. And okay. it's, it's a cold place. Okay. Logically, you'd think, well, they could just stay yeah. here and have cold winter. Right, you think but so? They have this habit. That's how they, they okay. exist. So, what so what attracted you to this book? Well, actually, uh, I guess Cindy Cope sponsored. She's yeah. a very big in natural things in Fayetteville, uh, and she sponsored <laughs> seminars. I don't know if it was two, uh, 2007, 2009, maybe. And this edition of this book by Doug Tellamy uh, was the newest edition. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure when he first published it, but he based, based it on many, many uh, uh, different sources. He's, it's well documented. And Cindy actually paid for a seminar over yeah. at the, uh, the um, global campus. It was. When that occurred, it was right. called the Continuing Education Center. Right. But anyway, it's right off the square. So a lot of people came, and a lot of people uh, bought the books, and it became a reference book for people who wanted to do the right thing for our environment. Right. And it, it, covers, it covers so many categories, things that many of us already believed, but we didn't have this much documentation in one book. You could, right. you could look up information to, to suggest the, uh, find the facts and yeah. suggest the legitimacy of your argument. Right. But here's a book that spells it out for us. So Tony says that uh, all plants are not created equal. Well, <laughs> all people aren't that either. Sounds kind of, that not, sounds kind of elitist. We, yes, we, <laughs> Our, our nation is built on non-discrimination against right. <laughs> everybody, but in the plant world, we're sort of merciless. Yeah, because the the alien plants are not going to become right. a, a good citizen. People from every other part of the the, the earth have become good citizens yeah. in the formation of the United States. So uh, the the plants that do the most for native insects, and it, when you say you're doing it for insects, you're also doing it for birds. And birds are more popular than insects. I mean, you know that. I mean, They're a lot of pretty, people don't want to see a bird. They, they sing nice songs. Yes. Oh, yeah. But they, to feed their young in the spring, they need earthworms, every kind of insect that's considered um, ugly or mean, like a wasp, yeah. can be important. And the uh, most important for some species of birds is the spider. And things in the spider category are collected to feed to the baby birds. They've got to have protein. They can't eat seed, uh, berries, and that sort of thing when they're young. They can have all the spiders at my house. Well, yeah, I invite birds in yeah. to check them out. Yeah. But uh, so getting this is, if we were doing an Omni book discussion, right. we'd mention getting, coming to peace with nature. Right. And Talamy's really telling us how to do that. Yeah. Because uh, so many people are at war 
at war with nature. And do you think some people are control uh, nature? Do you think some people are at war with nature, uh, but they're well-meaning? Well, certainly they're well-meaning. I mean, they they've been taught. Uh, you know, when you're if you're farming, you've got to get out weeds, yeah. whether they're native or not, for your crop success. Right. But if you spray them and wipe them off your whole property, then you're reducing the number of potential pollinators. Right. The the two or three species that are good and, and at least one species of, of honeybee that's considered dangerous and, and shouldn't be in the United States are used for pollination. And the settlers that brought over the uh, non-native food plants, and some of them were slaves who were brought over from Africa, yeah. brought some wonderful plants, plus the knowledge of how to cook them, what to do to make them what we consider not just soul food, but Cajun food, and right. so many dishes, Italian food, yeah. French dishes. Yeah. So um, those, um, those people who propagate honeybees have had a burden for the last decade, really. Honeybees slowly disappearing, in some cases rapidly, whole hives wiped out. So you might have a hive, a successful hive in Fayetteville or Siloam Springs or Fort Smith, and somebody will want to rent it from you to take to California for the really? crops. People ship hives of bees. But if we leave the native plants, we have not only varieties of bees that are native, many of them much smaller than our honeybees, but they do the pollinating job. And the, the uh, butterflies and, and uh, flower flies, things that are the fly class instead of the uh, bee class that yeah. look like bees. And they're, they're whole category, big category right. of, of flower flies. So those pollinators are just as important and would do the job for most plants that we want to see. And mo much of our food crop could be pollinated by those species. Right. So what about Aubrey Shepard? I mean, so um, do you feel a special affinity to nature yourself? Because you do a lot of short takes. People can see you a lot on this station. Well, um, yes, talking and, about nature. And your affinity for nature is the reason I do those. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Uh, maybe there's a little politics in them, some of them. Or and, and proselytizing. The year and proselytizing yeah. for nature more than anything else. And that that gets into the pro political realm because if if every politician in America read this book yeah. and could relate to it, then many things would change. And many of those, one of those things in particular that I talk about a lot is is mowing and mowing is considered the duty of human beings we right. have city every city's got regulations about how how often and how short your grass should be and why should you mow it but let me let me refer to a sheet here if i don't lose my mic about lawn reduction and this is from the national wildlife Federation. yeah and the facts here are pretty Simple. Did you know that approximately 20 million U.S. acres, 20 million acres are planted as residential law? 30 to 60 percent of urban fresh water is used for watering lawns, and the percentage varies by city. How much rainfall you have and whether you need to water. 67 million pounds of synthetic pesticides are used on lawns in the United States. Areas of lawn that include only one type of plant, such as a particular grass, offer little habitat for wildlife. Yard waste, mostly grass clippings, makes up 20% of municipal solid waste collected, and most of it ends up in landfills. So you can see that <laughs> It's not just about the wildlife. Yeah. It's about the money you earn and how you're going to spend it. Yeah. And the taxes we pay and right. how it's spent. Um, 
the mowing of right-of-ways of highways is a massive expense, not even in, yeah. talked about in this category of law. Do you think some people uh, just don't have much of an understanding of the importance of this? Do you think it might seem too complicated for a lot of people? Well, if you read Doug Tallamy's book and you read every page, and I've read some of them many times over several years, and use them as reference material. I try to identify plants and species of insects, and that book is very useful for that, and, and figure out which plant in my yard or on a prairie I'm out visiting or in the woods may be harboring certain species of small creatures. Yeah. And some of those things are so tiny you can only see them with a magnifying glass or uh, your extreme close-up with a camera. You yeah. can photograph the details of them, but you can't see them with my glasses or right. yours. And so um, it's complicated if you want to be an expert on yeah. it. You, know, you, could, you could have a PhD just on the contents of that book right. and maybe in three different subjects that he writes about in there. And he's, a, he's an entomologist, and that's what makes him powerful because he starts at that basic thing of what What's the significance? What's yeah. the feed? What, what's the use of these native plants? Yeah. One of the chapter headings is you know, about the vital new role of the suburban garden. Well, we have a, in motion in Fayetteville right now, the city council has authorized a study by the staff yeah. to see what advances we can make in urban gardening. More and more people are wanting to be able to have their own garden. They're wanting to, to share food with others. Yeah. And they don't want food that's shipped from California or Florida or right. South Louisiana or Texas. They would like to have fresh food. Right. One of the things that not many people produce in the United States without a greenhouse and particular skills is, is the banana. Now, bananas come from far away in the jungles and right. so forth. And they're shipped here green as can be. Well, when I buy a banana, I try to look for the ones that are already turning black. Why? Because they're sweet. The they, green is that, does that mean they're almost rotten? It would be. But, you know, if you were, if you were one of our, uh, uh, one of the other species of, of, uh, of, uh, Creatures that walk on two legs and yes. have arms more than four feet. Like a chimpanzee? Yeah. Okay. You might be eating a banana in its native habitat. But I'm not a chimpanzee. But you would not be eating the green bananas. You would wait till they're sweet. But I'm not a chimpanzee. Well, see, you have a right to eat those stinking green bananas. But I like, if, the, I like if, the green and yellow bananas. Yeah, you know? but, but the... Uh, the fact is, in nature, those would probably be on the ground before yeah. an animal ate them. Yeah. And the monkeys and such would have the advantage to be able to climb up there and eat them. Right. But if you have a banana peel that's turned black, yeah. as you say, looks rotten, but it's very juicy inside, and you cut off, just cut a little section out of it, peel yeah. and the center, and if you don't like it, Give it to your dog. No. I bet your dog will eat it instantly. And if you have a pet rabbit, there's, there's so many. There's so, there's so many responses to that. <laughs> but, but your pet rabbit will love it. Okay. You never, they may be more discerning than a dog. Not enough. They're more discerning, but they certainly love bananas and banana peels. Okay. So when you see somebody throwing away a banana peel, point out to them that if they have rabbits or dogs. Okay. They will probably eat those, and okay. they get twice the bang for their buck when they buy that banana. Okay. And so is it good for a dog? Doesn't seem to hurt them. Okay. They, okay. They thrive on. Okay. Do you get the feeling the author feels a moral imperative? Well, uh, I when think he, he, book? he really does, uh, and I, I think I share his moral imperative that as a person who's willing and able at well. I'll be 73 by the time this runs on TV, probably. In, it's going to run next week. 
well, okay, I'll, I'll be about to turn 73 on, on Halloween. There you go. But anyway, I, I feel a need to do something worthwhile yeah. and continue to do some of the things. I was an outdoor writer for years, Yeah. and this is part of outdoor writing. I no longer can stand to be in a duck blind in sub-freezing weather. Yeah. I can't fish in a bass tournament when it's right. 110. Yeah. But the uh, things that people appreciate and enjoy, such as flowers and, and hummingbirds and butterflies and all these things, they're available. And right. And they're a lot closer to home. Yeah. And I feel an imperative to try to encourage people to protect and propagate yeah. those things. Right. And, and people at home, and people uh, who read this book, certainly, and, and people with their, their own gardens can slow the rate of extinction for a lot of plants who are, who are in danger. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Of, we were talking about milkweed and, yeah. and monarchs, but there's something called basket flower. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful plant. It's the American basket flower. It's Centauria Americana. Right. And usually, if you're looking at the scientific names of, of uh, plants, if something says Americana, that means it's a native U.S. Right. Usually. And uh, it will, it may say Canada, Canada or Canadensis. That means it's it comes also from Canada? Our, our continent. Okay. And, and it probably is native here just as yeah. well as Canada. Okay. Eastern Canada is very much like here. New yeah. England's native plants are very much identical yeah. to the ones here. But uh, Illinois, they might be a little different, but they're closer to uh, the same here okay. than, than any other otherwise. Um, so what was that question? About gardeners can slow the rate of extinction. Okay. The, the uh, Centauria Americana, the American basket flower. Yeah. The flower looks like the prettiest thistle flower yeah. you've ever seen, and but it does not have those spiny things on the leaves or right. on the stem, and it's not in the same family. But you might, if you don't like thistles, you might think, well, I don't want that plant in my yard. But if you look closely and it's one of those, then you will want it. But it's an it's an annual plant, which means it's got to make seed every year if it's to reproduce. It's not yeah. going to grow back from its roots. Really? And so it's essential that it not be mowed down before this time of year. It should, if you reduce the mowing of property that you want to display native plants and have all the benefits yeah. for wildlife and your, your own pleasure, then you only mow in the dead of winter. Okay. Now, on many of the big prairie plots, such as the, the area at Lake Fayetteville, right. they spend a lot of money. It costs $5,000 to just bring them in in trucks over here, and it may be a lot more by the time they get done with the right. burn. But a controlled burn will also suppress non-native species and allow natives to grow. And the reason that there's such a problem with things like Japanese honeysuckle brought here, uh, what we call China honeysuckle brought yeah. here. It's a bush honeysuckle. Right. And there's a big city effort to remove some of this, but it's been here for 100 years. And kudzu is also coming north, and it's a non native. Oh, we all love kudzu. Oh, it's, it's been known for generations. Yeah. And the, uh, so something like American basket flower has to be treated carefully and encouraged and people that get it in their yard. I've got some growing in my yard and every day I'd go out and make pictures this summer when they were in bloom and they bloomed into the fall here. The last ones I've seen have been two weeks ago in bloom, uh, early, just late September, first week of October. And they, uh, they go to seed and you can collect the seed after those seed pods are, this is a rule with most of them, they'll turn brown. And, yeah. And you can find the little seeds in there, they're different shapes. But they're, uh, in the case of the basket flower, you'd want to plant it probably 
probably using his advice maybe in this book, but it's certainly available other places on specific plants and when to plant them. Save the seeds carefully under uh, safe conditions, get, dry them out a little bit and so forth, and plant them in April in the case of Northwest Arkansas in yeah. the basket flower. And they will grow up to eight feet tall if they're in a good, wet, rich soil situation. But um, uh, on the other hand, if you keep mowing them down as it occurs along our highways and where new developments occur, right. uh, they red dirt the surface, these native plants won't come back from deep down under that red dirt. Okay. And so construction sites are the worst for yeah. native plants. Okay, okay. Well, I think I have a, I think I have a, even been more understanding now than I did uh, before I started the book. Well, if you if you reread parts of that book, if you're interested in gardening, then you'll always be learning a little something more, a little subtlety that that you might not have noticed. And okay. Among the things he, he lists all the trees that support butterflies, and the uh, the fact that hundreds of species are Propagated by yeah. our, our uh, major oaks and hackberries and yeah. all these species we have in northwest Arkansas. But um, at the same time, there are sections on what beetles use the underground, the right. dead parts of right. plants and, okay. and all those things. It's, well, it's a marvelous book. Okay. Well, Aubrey, I want to thank you very much for being on the show. And the name of the book is Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife with Native Plants. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's an interesting book. So, Aubrey, thanks very much for being on the show. Well, thank you for allowing me to be here, Richard. I oh, appreciate it. It's a fun show. Anyway, thanks, uh, thanks very much for watching, and uh, read a book. We just net or net. Affleck, Affleck. <laughs> okay, bring me back. All right. Hi, this day is Aubrey Shepard. We're going to discuss a book called Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain Wildlife and Nature. I'm going to bring the book a little bit closer to me for this. All right, let's, let's do this again. All right. Hello, my name is Olivia Hines and I am part of the Occupy Northwest Arkansas movement and you are watching Fayetteville Public Access Television. Smoking gave me COPD, which makes it harder and harder for me to breathe. I have a tip for you. If your doctor gives you five years to live, spend it talking with your grandchildren. Explain to them that your grandpa's not gonna be around anymore to share his wisdom and his love. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. And I'm running out of time. You can quit. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW.